Welcome to the Fields Institute for Research in Mathematical Sciences. My name is Deirdre Haskell, and I am the Deputy Director of the Institute. We're physically located at 222 College Street in downtown Toronto, and I take this opportunity to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto and the Fields Institute operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. As you may be participating from elsewhere, may we suggest that you research the history of your land using the website nativeland.ca. The Fields Institute is a network of 20 universities, federally funded through NSERC and CIHR, provincially through the Ministry of Colleges and Universities, and also through the National Science Foundation of the USA, the Simons Foundation, and by many individual generous donors. You may already know that the Institute, you may already know the Institute through attendance at one of our programs or events. For those of you joining us for the first time, the Fields Institute organizes a wide range of events related to research in the mathematical sciences. Our signature event is the Fields Medal Symposium, which is a celebration of a recent Fields Medal winner, but our research generally spans the entire spectrum from fundamental to applied and in industry-facing research. For the last two years, the Institute has been very involved in modeling the pandemic and providing mathematical expertise to policy and decision makers. In addition, last year, we introduced What the Numbers Say as an outreach activity, giving an opportunity for members of the public to ask questions of the modelers directly. While we are still dealing with the pandemic, and attention is shifting to the next phase, one that researchers describe as endemicity. This evening's discussion will help us to understand what this means. I'm very pleased to welcome today's panel, all of whom are affiliated with the Mathematics for Public Health project of the Institute and have been directly involved in the pandemic response from day one. And they're here today to talk about end endemicity, what it is and what it means for us going forward. On that note, I'd like to introduce, introduce our moderator, Professor Michael Lee, who is a professor of mathematics at the University of Alberta and an expert on mathematical theories of epidemic models. During the COVID-19 pandemic, his research group provided modeling support for, for Alberta Health, and he recently moderated a module of the MFPH workshop on COVID-19 endemicity, which took place at the end of January. Michael, over to you. Thank you, Deirdre, for the introduction. And uh, hi, everyone. I'm Michael Lee. Uh, uh, I'm a mathematician and uh, I'm passionate about using mathematical modeling tools to support public health decisions. And uh, welcome to uh, this episode of uh, the What the Numbers Say. And uh, I'm happy to lead the discussions today. And these discussions give the public a uh, opportunity to ask questions directly to our experts and um, whom we often see uh, in the news or quoted in the news. And uh, so as in the past events, today we have a truly impressive group of experts with us. And uh, I'll give you a brief introduction of the experts. Uh, Dr. Jay Heffernan uh, is a professor of mathematics at York University. She is an expert on modeling immunity to infections. And uh, he, she is the co-director uh, of the Center for Disease Modeling at York. And uh, her research studies uh, models uh, for viral uh, dynamics and uh, immune responses within the host, and linking these knowledges to uh, disease transmissions at the population level and for research was used as evidence to inform uh, public health decisions and policies. And uh, we have Dr. Stephen Hoffman, who uh, is a lawyer and a global health expert. And he holds a, a Dada Lay Distinguished Chair in Global Governance and the Legal Epidemiology. And uh, he's also a professor of global health, law, and political science at the York University. And he's the director of WHO's Collaborating Center on Global Governance of Antimicrobial Resistance and the scientific director of the Institute of Population and Public Health of the CIHR. And, uh, and then we have Dr. Amy 
uh, Herford, uh, is mass, mass, mathematical biologist and experts on population dynamics, ecology, and the evolutionary epidemiology. Uh, she holds faculty positions in several departments at the University of Newfoundland and Labrador, and uh, includes biology, mathematics, and statistics, and also cross pointed at the Faculty of Medicine. Uh, she is a member of the province's predictive analytics modeling group during the pandemic. And thank you all for taking your time uh, to join today's discussion. So our today's topic is COVID endemicity. And uh, we're at the two years mark uh, into the COVID-19 pandemic. And at this juncture, uh, we have seen uh, Omicron cases across Canada have declining uh, COVID related hospitalizations, ICUs and death numbers are getting lower and public health restrictions are being lifted uh, across Canada and in many other countries too, around the world. And uh, we're told to be learning to live with the COVID in our lives. And uh, uh, but there are many questions uh, in our uh, in our minds and also in public health in public's mind, such as do we just naturally transition from pandemic uh, to endemic or to a normal life or back to the normal, or should there some preventive measures be kept in place? And uh, so, what about the new variants? And uh, will they cause another huge wave? Will they threaten our public health capacities? And especially uh, considering Omicron is still raging in some of the parts in Asia. And uh, so with that as a drop, backdrop, uh, I'll start to ask some of the questions we collected from the audience. Uh, I think on the top of the order, the most important question would be, I wanted to, I wanted to know that how would you uh, define adamacy? And uh, how do we know we're there. So feel free to jump in with your opinion. <laughs> okay. I'm I'm happy to go, Michael, if that's helpful. Or, or yes, please. Who? Okay. Great. Great. So first a big thanks to the Fields Institute for um, organizing this series, bringing all of us uh, together. I am, um, you know, when thinking about the uh, definition of, of endemic, um, I mean, there, on one hand, it, I mean, it's a technical term uh, in epidemiology, uh, really just meaning that it's uh, a disease that's regularly found in a certain population or a certain area. Um, there isn't a clear uh, threshold, a certain number to ascribe whether something is a, a pandemic versus an endemic, um, but it is, it's a technical term. Um, but what's also really interesting about it though, is that it's also a very social term and that we as a society are, and societies around the world are basically deciding whether we are in an endemic phase or about to becoming an endemic phase and such. I think what's really important though, right up front is to debunk a myth that I see a lot in the news media about endemic being a good thing. In many respects, when um, a disease becomes endemic, it means that it's here to stay. Yes, we have to live with it, but too often in the news media, it's then become associated with with freedom and with, with all the uh, restrictions that, uh, or the protections rather that have been put in place over the past couple of years, that suddenly means we get back to normal. But the reality is, is that if we are in an endemic phase where this is here to stay and we have to live with it, it's more reflective of raising the white flag of, of surrender in a sense that we at, during this pandemic tried to do something humans have never done, which is really beat back a global pandemic. Um, in a way using new technologies, new approaches to protect millions of lives. Um, we are though at a place where there's so much virus circulating that uh, we are on a path towards endemicity. And um, that's not a good thing, even though certainly in the news media and with our lives, it does mean that we just have to learn to live with it. Yeah. I'm sure the others though will have uh, yeah. different points so to bring. Please share your opinions. Sure, I'll say um, as a mathematical modeler, often when we're looking at when infectious new infectious diseases are introduced into a population, we'll see the in infections kind of go through this dampened type of oscillation. 
going like this over time. And I guess I kind of mathematically defined endemicity when we're getting down towards these, these waves of infection that have a lower magnitude. Um, and so we can, we can see that over time, what will happen is uh, will endemicity, just like what Stephen just said, that uh, we'll be able to find the disease around, so we still might have oscillations happening in the future. And so while there might be seasons where there are less, less cases and seasons where there are more, um, and everyone has experienced an endemicity of influenza. Uh, and it, that could be something that we, we will see for COVID-19. Those are great answers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, so thanks to the Fields Institute for inviting me to be part of this panel. I'm really happy to be here. So uh, my answer for a definition of endemicity is that at the global level, immunity against transmission is relatively constant if no new variants emerge. And so like Jane, I, I think about this from a mathematical point of view, and I think of end endemicity when you have a relatively flat number of cases. The mechanism underlying that in mathematical models is often that immunity at the population level is relatively constant. At the individual level, you'll have some waning and you'll have some individuals be born and you'll have some people be vaccinated. So changes are happening at the individual level, but at the population level, uh, it's, it's relatively constant. I also said that this should, it should be relatively constant at the global level because the a pandemic is referring to global spread. And also with SARS-CoV-2, uh, it spreads so easily across the globe that I think it's necessary to think of a definition on, on that kind of scale. Otherwise you're gonna have importations that are gonna bump you off this constant uh, type of trajectory. And then I, I said, if no new variants emerge, because I think new variants are going to emerge and practically if I don't add that into the definition, then immunity is gonna change. When you see a new variant like Omicron emerge, then all of a sudden vaccine protection against transmission isn't what it used to be. And all of a sudden there's a big change at the global level on immunity, so. Yeah, thanks very much. Those were very good, uh, I guess. Uh, people, yeah, uh, I remember uh, my home province is of Alberta. I, I've been paying attention to the, uh, to the cases uh, during the, uh, working with the Alberta House. Uh, at the end of the fourth wave, the Delta wave, for about a more than 30 days, at the tail, tail and end of the fourth wave, uh, the, the cases are around 300 for about 30 days, up and down. It's a fairly constant. At the time, I always found it. This is a probably endemicity, right? We, but then the Omicron wave came. So there's a new variant so that changed everything. So, so obviously the variants will be a big part of the equation, whether we will, will transition into uh, uh, the endemic, endemic state, for example. So, so let's talk about the, the variants. And uh, so uh, this is probably more to, uh, uh, Jane, Lamy, and I'll first ask towards them, and then Stephen, you feel free to follow up. Uh, and uh, so, what do we know about a possible future events? How much can we say? And uh, should we be concerned that they may cause, they may evade vaccine immunity, or they may be maybe the immunity waning, and then the new variants would it, would it infect a lot of people? Uh, and uh, do we require booster shots? Do we require booster shots every three months, for example? Uh, so how do you feel about this? Jane, you wanna start? Sure. Um, yeah, so an infectious disease can, can be ever, ever changing. Um, and so we can expect to see new variants arise. Um, for, uh, this, uh, the probability of seeing a new variant arise is going to depend, of course, on the number of people infected. The more people infected, the more, the higher the probability that a new variant will arise. Um, and certainly as uh, pathogens evolve over time, they, they um, naturally select for fitness characteristics that allow them to be maybe uh, more transmissible, 
or have you know more asymptomatic infection so that they are more transmissible because they want to be replicated. Um, and so, uh, of course, we will see new variants over time. It's hard to project exactly what the variants will look like, but uh, I will say that with um, with the vaccines and the new vaccine technologies that that can be uh, revamped in a, a, a pretty fast timeline, uh, then we might be able to get new vaccines that will quickly be able to be uh, used to generate immunity immunity that in individuals that are vaccinated against these new specific variants. Uh, we also can think about cross immunity, right? And so that uh, if we've been vaccinated before or infected before, then we can have some cross immunity protection against infection or if infected against severe disease uh, against new variants. But our immunity um, can wane over time. And, uh, and, and so it's, it's difficult to say exactly how much protection you will have against a new variant. Uh, and so uh, while a variants will, new variants will arise, um, it's difficult to say exactly how much protection we'll have. Um, and that's, that's a question for an endemicity that we've also seen in influenza, where we can have you know, periodic vaccination programs or targeted age groups and so on. Uh, when we do have new variants uh, arising from season to season. Thank you. So, uh, Amy, you're an evolutionary biologist, so I probably can offer your insight into this uh, evolution of variants. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree a lot with what Jane said. Uh, one of the things about viruses and pathogens is they don't really want to evolve to make life easier for humans. They probably want to make life more difficult for humans. They're going to evolve to be more transmissible. That's, that's probably the strongest selection pressure. And exactly what that means can be kind of subtle. Jane, Jane mentioned this, that maybe a way for, for a virus to be more transmissible is to be asymptomatic for longer or to have a higher fraction of asymptomatic cases. And throughout the pandemic so far, maybe this relates a bit to the idea of endemicity, I think as a, as a mathematician, I try to be careful about what I, what I mean about transmission and, and it, it starts getting more complicated because when the, no one was vaccinated or no one had infection induced immunity, then it was kind of obvious what transmission meant. But then all these heterogeneities, all these different types of people in the population with different vaccination status. And so now when you start talking about what it means to be more transmissible, uh, you know, there's issues about reinfection or uh, evasion of vaccines. So, yeah, it, in terms of um, the, the evolution, uh, it's, we've seen every successive variant that's come along be more transmissible. We've seen some have more severe disease. Uh, maybe we've seen some change in the asymptomatic rates. I, I think Omicron is more asymptomatic. Uh, but, you know, we, we have so much, so many people that are infected that there's just so much opportunity, like Jane said, for, for new variants to emerge and whatever is going to be the most difficult for humans to respond to is, is probably what's going to be selected for. Thank you. And, uh, we do have a question from live audience and it's more to, uh, Stephen's expertise. Uh, is the question is, is there legal continuation to the term and the misty? Yeah, so there, there, yeah, Michael, thanks for the question and thanks to the audience for the question. The, um, so no, not directly, except, um, you know, uh, endemicity in a sense reflects a regular pattern of disease emerging as, as Amy and Jane were also emphasizing. And so the kind of response that might be um, acceptable or might be constitutional for governments to do during a normal, in a normal situation, in normal times, might look a little different than what would be allowed by government during, uh, for example, a national emergency or a global pandemic, something that's clearly, um, well, as that per the definition, not the normal. And so uh, when you think, for example, about um, internal um, uh, travel restrictions within Canada, uh, there was so the Atlantic bubble, for example, that we saw where um, Atlantic provinces did not allow travel into those provinces from other Canadians, which um, on its face could have been a violation of Canadians' rights to mobility under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. 
that was actually challenged in court on exactly that basis. But uh, the courts uh, in Newfoundland uh, ruled that, well, um, we're in a, a, a pandemic situation. There's lots that's unknown and that the precautionary principle then justifies the government of Newfoundland and the other governments to take those extraordinary measures. Would that court decision have been the same if those internal travel restrictions were in place while COVID-19 or after COVID-19 had been deemed to be endemic? Maybe not. So no, there's no immediate legal connotation for the term endemicity, but there could be um, clear consequences for what governments would be constitutionally allowed to do or not. Thank you. Good answer. And uh, there are two other questions from the live audience uh, that has to do with the endemicity. Uh, that probably is more for uh, for Amy. So, how would why would endemicity not promote new variants? And uh, could uh, Omicron hasten the transition into the pandemic state? So maybe Amy could uh, start with that. Yeah, I think endemicity would select for new variants, and and I expect new variants to emerge. I think that that's what we've seen happen over and over again. And the only way that's not gonna happen is if we manage to eradicate COVID and, and we're talking about endemicity and, and I don't think that's gonna happen. So I expect new variants to emerge. In my definition, I said, assuming no new variants emerge because the idea of endemicity is kind of a constant thing. And I just don't think that that applies to SARS-CoV-2 because it's evolving so much. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of had to take this idea of constant immunity, which comes from the mathematical models, but is an epidemiological definition that overlooks evolution and modify it. So, so it works for a virus that evolves so much. Yeah. Maybe this is one of, one of uh, the take homes from um, the pandemic is that we need to be thinking more about evolutionary epidemiology and not just thinking about pathogens that are static and also thinking about how our actions like uh, using antimicrobials or, or therapeutic agents are going to select for certain um, ca characteristics, how, how our behavior might select for different things as well. Uh, could Omicron hasten the transition from pandemic to endemic? Uh, I think under my definition, uh, yes, because I'm, I'm looking for a, a leveling off of immunity and Omicron is infecting a lot of people very quickly. So there's a lot of natural immunity building. So I, I would say yes to that second question. Okay. Jane, you want to add something quickly? Or? It has to do with the immunity, I guess, the second question. Right? Yeah, sure. So I'll, I'll say that um, I guess in terms of endemicity, oh, again, I'm just going to bring up, you know, what people have experienced previously. And we know that influenza is endemic and we know that our distributions of immunity in the population do change over time as new variants arise. Um, and so in terms of looking at a constant immunity or some, some varying that we will expect that our immunity will vary because it will wane and and, and increase with, with consecutive waves of infection. Uh, but it's just difficult to know exactly uh, how big those waves of infection will be because we just don't know exactly what variants are going to be arising. Though um, an educated guess could, could be something similar to what we experience in influenza seasons that are more severe and more mild. Thank you. So I guess we probably never feel secure, we will be secure as long as there's potential of a big, something called the big waves in the future. Right? So the technology probably would, would help us to be more prepared to deal with these sorts of things on certain days. Yeah. So let's move on a little bit. Uh, this one's more for Stephen, uh, because your global health is your specialty. And uh, was it the global uh, app uh, perspective on the need of public health measures, especially given still the I mean, Omicron is still very active, very serious in some parts of the world. Yeah, so Michael, thanks for the question. You know, I really appreciate um, having the opportunity to talk about the global perspective in it. You know, and, and actually this panel, I mean, Jane and Amy are, are bringing that global perspective too. I, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with recognizing that 
this pandemic is not done. And that even though, for example, in Ontario, uh, our cabinet or premier had sort of politically decided the pandemic's done on March 21 and 11 days from now. <laughs> um, I mean, that's, it's not really a, it's not a political decision, right? I mean, this is a virus that's evolving and moving and transmitting. And as was mentioned in, in many parts of Asia, it's at the worst point of this pandemic that they've experienced since the beginning. So my point though is it actually very much builds on what Jane said earlier, which is that the more infections there are, the more virus that's circulating around the world, the more opportunities there are for new variants of concern to emerge. What that means is this question about like, taking the global perspective, it's exactly what we have to do. And indeed when Amy built it into her definition, it highlights that we're all in this together. And if we think that by like an order of council in a, in a cabinet of a province or uh, that we can sort of decide when the pandemic ends, um, we're gonna be disappointed when we find new variants come and then come back to us uh, through travel and, and trade in other places. So I, um, the reality then is that the best approach to getting through this pandemic from a global perspective would be to make sure that we uh, address this pandemic everywhere. That has not happened in the world. We have had a very inequitable response, whereas myself in Canada, well, all of us in the panel were based in Canada. We've had the benefits of uh, rapid access to vaccines, uh, diagnostics, other, and now increasingly um, other medical countermeasures, um, antivirals. My point though is most places in the world haven't had that kind of access. And so we could get to a place where this is, let's say temporarily endemic in Canada, only for this virus to continue to fester and evolve elsewhere in the world, only for it to come back to Canada as in causing new waves because there isn't the immunity to these new variants in the same way that um, we're starting to see now. So uh, the global perspective is, is not as optimistic as um, our political leaders have decided around March 21. <laughs> um, and I think that's a problem that affects all of us. Thank you very much. And uh, just on that uh, lifting measures on March 21, we have, do have a questions uh, related to that, and particularly in uh, the context of uh, Ontario. We know that the government decided to lift all the measures and, uh, on March 21. There are concerns right? uh, that uh, removing ma masking mandate in schools, for example, is premature and it could result in avoidable school closures. Uh, do we have enough data to predict what may happen in Canada? Uh, if, if so that's so, Jane, you want to take shot at that? Sure. Um, so uh, there's lots of discussion about masking uh, right now. Are we going to keep our masks? Are we going to relax the max mask mandates? Or we we will relax the mask mandates. But uh, how? Are, what are people going to choose uh, after March 21st? And um, I, I think that there are still a, a lot of things to, to think about, um, especially in schools. Uh, there's some uh, research that's come out recently to show that children are, are less transmissible compared to adults for COVID-19. Um, there are uh, also things to say that children have higher level of contact uh, compared to adults. Uh, so maybe those two things will, will weigh in and make things kind of similar in terms of contact and transmissibility. Um, uh, we also can consider uh, other aspects that are other opening up in the community as well, like people are going back to work, um, uh, sports and uh, after school programs are maybe going to be uh, increased, as well as, you know, just individuals going out to the movies or going to see a hockey game. Um, and so there's certainly lots of things that are going to be happening after March 21st that will uh, enable more transmission uh, of, of, the, of the current variant and maybe even a new variant. Um, in terms of looking at data, uh, we, we can incorporate mathematical modeling of behavior into, into our models. And so we try to incorporate decision-making and, and how individuals um, consider trade-offs between infection and wearing masks, which, which they might not feel as comfortable uh, anymore. Uh, maybe it's getting too hot, I don't know. Um, and so we can incorporate this type of decision-making into our mathematical models that, that we can then use because we've also seen how people have been behaving over the entire pandemic that we can fit into our model uh, and then project 
what, you know, what the maximum level of, of taking off masks might look like and, and what the minimum level might look like and then see if those are acceptable for healthcare um, and, and see if, you know, are we going to um, expect more infections that are going to cause severe infection that will require healthcare and ICU and ward beds. And so uh, while I, I haven't seen some recent results that have to do with that, that's something that my group is working on, just trying to, you know, project what that maximum is when we relax and, and say, even allow contacts to go back to pre, pre-pandemic uh, contact structure in the population. So uh, in terms of data, there is data that we can use uh, from the past and, and from current Omicron cases and infections and hospitalizations. So we should be able to get you know, some idea of the, the minimum and the maximum of what we expect to happen after March 21st. Thank you, Jane. I, uh... I can uh, uh, the uh, how to incorporate uh, human behavioral change uh, during the pandemic uh, or an epidemic in response to public health responses or to the infection levels, and these are the one of the uh, major challenges in modeling, and uh, this is one of the big topic that we study in the network of uh, mathematics for uh, public health. Right? So, so just keeping up with time, I'm, I'm moving along. And uh, the next question is more uh, towards Amy. And uh, so, and also related to uh, the previous question, we're talking about the global, global uh, perspective. Uh, things could, could come into Canada from other places. And uh, so uh, given the, the amount of travel there is in the world, and it's probably more travel uh, when everything's opened up, uh, is it possible to have endemicity in one part of the world and others apart? So I guess uh, uh, Stephen touched a bit, a bit on this, so and Amy, and I also have a, a follow-up question after uh, you gave your answer. <laughs> yeah. So I think for SARS-CoV-2, no, it's not possible to have endemicity in one place and not in another. That's because there's so much silent transmission and it's so transmissible, that it's just, it's it's near impossible to keep a variant out. I mean, we have seen, I think every single variant established in every single province in Canada, every single time. So it's it's just part of COVID. It's, it's really hard to detect. For something else, maybe like chicken pox, where, you know, you get a rash on your face and it might be a bit harder to get on the plane and go there. Maybe it's a bit easier to disrupt the transmission chains, and maybe it is possible to, um, you know, have some regions where it's, it's you know, if it was, a, you know, a pathogen that was more like that, that was easier to identify and cut off the transmission chains. Then maybe, but I think for for COVID nineteen, it's just way too hard to detect and way too transmissible for that to be possible. Okay, so thank you. And uh, along the same lines, let's uh, look at the uh, in the context of Canada. Uh, we have different provinces. Each province seems to have their own uh, responses to uh, the pandemic during the past two years. And uh, so, uh, so whether we should be looking at a one size fits all kind of responses or a more nuanced approach, looking at a different uh, uh, small jurisdictions, the large cities. Uh, so you're from uh, Atlantic uh, provinces. Probably you can offer us uh, your experience uh, in this, Amy. Yeah. So this is something that I've become really interested in during the pandemic. Is just that I think smaller jurisdictions have, for some aspects of the pandemic, had different best responses. And so you know, COVID zero got a lot of amazing press where everyone admired New Zealand so much for their COVID zero strategy. Uh, But I'm more, I'm more of the opinion that maybe, you know, not everywhere for every variant at every point in time was COVID zero, the right thing to do. Even New Zealand, when the Delta variant got established, pulled off their elimination strategy. I think if you're in a region that sees a lot of importation or there's a lot of high density housing, or there's a lot of public transit use. In some ways that's, that's gonna mirror what it's like for a variant to be more transmissible. So 
I think part of the reason why the, um, the, the approach that Newfoundland and Labrador took to managing the, the pandemic with strict border restrictions and an elimination strategy was partly due to geographic and social factors, Newfoundland being an island and, uh, you know, Labrador also having, you know, a, a land border with Quebec, but, you know, not, not a lot of travel relative to something that, you know, would say like the, the uh, Ottawa, you know, uh, between Quebec and Ontario, seeing a lot of interprovincial travel by road that would be really hard to, um, to understand. And the other thing would just be the, the public health capacity in different regions, as well as another factor that goes into it. We talk about uh, managing to healthcare capacity um, in, you know, th that varies in different, in different provinces. So I think my kind of experience trying to advise on the pandemic was that sometimes what bigger provinces or the World Health Organization are recommending is fantastic. And, and you know, I don't think there's a need to reinvent the wheel and, and do like a Newfoundland and Labrador model for that. We can just justify it based on what the World Health Organization has said, or, or you know, because they cater to countries sort of like larger places in Newfoundland and Labrador. And other times, uh, questions, you know, there, there are specific uh, aspects of the particular place that you're interested in. Newfoundland and Labrador has a lot of rotational workers, people who are working out of province, and that's another characteristic locally that I think has affected some of the best strategies. So I don't think there's a one size fits all approach. However, with these variants that are now so, so transmissible, some of the things that we might have been able to take advantage of in Newfoundland and Labrador, like low transmission for geographical reasons, uh, are less accessible to us now because of the way that transmission has evolved with successive variants. Michael, I think if I if yes. I can come in on this, I um, yes, please. you know I think yes. part of the variation across provinces and the way they responded to this pandemic, part of it was based on sort of natural geographic factors. Some of it was just a response to case counts and other metrics, but other parts of the differing responses were based on different social values and different political preferences. Um, and I think uh, you know in a democracy, um, one reason why you design federal systems like in Canada is to enable more localized responses to different issues. Whether a public health um, crisis like uh, like a pandemic is one that should be at the provincial level. Um, that's a question. It was decided in 1867. But um, my point, though, in saying that is if governments at different points in this pandemic, they, they knew there had to be layers of protection, but they, they had choices. What kind do we put this protection on? Do we put that protection on? Do we lift this protection now that we have more degrees of freedom or do we not? Would we lift this one? And often provinces, for example, we're in a situation, do we let the kids go to school? or do we let some businesses reopen? And different provinces made different choices. And that was based on different uh, political preferences, different social values. And that plays into all of these decisions um, in a democratic society. And I don't think we'd actually want it any other way in the sense that uh, I think there's a lot of sometimes discourse about like getting politics out of pandemic responses. And yes, let's get to ideology, let's get partisan politics out, but we don't want to get politics out because that's taking democracy out. And that means citizens that aren't able to either steer the kind of response that they expect to their government. It also means citizens can't then hold their governments to account. And we do in a, in a democracy get to do that every time we go to the polls at election day. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your view based on my, our experience in my uh, home province. I think that's totally valid point there. Yeah, so let's move on. And uh, so uh, this is something uh, I asked about uh, uh, the uh, hospitalization and deaths that are caused directly, uh, can be directly attributed to COVID versus those happen to, uh, say, COVID positive patients died from other courses, uh, for other courses, causes, and not directly due to the seriousness of the uh, COVID. So maybe Jane, you could uh, talk a bit about this and uh, how do we distinguish, how do modelers distinguish these direct costs of deaths and uh, indirect kind of cost deaths of COVID? 
Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about my favorite thing, and it's called sensitivity analysis. <laughs> okay, good. So we're going to so look at no definitions, though. <laughs> no, I mean it'd be nice to know exactly uh, what deaths were due to COVID and what uh, are with COVID. Though you know, COVID can also exacerbate other conditions. Um, and so, when we're uh, taking this type of data into our modeling. Uh, it's, it's important for us to see how sensitive our, our, our results are, I guess, to what the input is and what fraction of these deaths we, we expect are due to uh, COVID or with COVID. So same with the number of cases, I guess, you know, when PCR testing was uh, more avail available to everybody um, and, and different from today, uh, we had to consider, you know, when were individuals choosing to go to get PCR tested versus if they had to go P go get PCR testing. Uh, so we do a big sensitivity analysis over all of these numbers and see uh, how robust our results are. And that helps us also get those minimum and maximums and confidence intervals that we can then use to inform uh, decision makers. Okay, good. Uh, anyone want to add something to that? Uh... Mike, I'm happy to just quickly share that um, Statistics Canada's uh, best effort in trying to actually look at those numbers in terms of COVID death, uh, deaths from COVID and excess mortality over the last two years just got published today. So um, for those who are joining live and able to see the um, chats, I've just posted the link uh, in the chat to that Stats Canada Great. report. Thanks very much, Stephen. And, uh... Now, next question is also uh, probably Stephen can take a lead on. Uh, this is about uh, probably you could share with us some of the difficulties you face in providing policy rec recommendations for decision makers. Uh, we know, for example, decision makers could have a, a economics, or politics, and ramifications for decisions. Uh, how do you or other scientists navigate that? Yeah, thanks, Michael. I um, you know, I think the starting point is recognizing that scientific evidence represents only one input of many legitimate inputs into decision making. Some of those uh, other inputs are, for example, what's legal, what's allowed under the law. Other things might be what's ethical. Others might be uh, related to questions of what can we afford. Others might be related to what have we promised uh, in international obligations to other countries and our, uh, or human rights implications. So um, my point is, uh, I think the starting place for any researcher uh, wanting to translate their research findings into policy is recognizing it's one very important input, maybe even the most important starting point for a decision, but it's only one point of data that's informing any decision. On that then we, um, quickly need to recognize that in the context of an emergency, uh, there's a lot of noise. In this pandemic, it seems like there's 7 billion people on the planet, it seems like there's 7 billion epidemiologists uh, <laughs> uh, who've come out in, uh, I mean, there's um, maybe not 7 billion uh, mathematical uh, modelers of infectious disease, uh, <laughs> but uh, I mean, as an epidemiologist, uh, myself are trained that way, um, uh, combining that with law, I. Um, yeah, everyone uh, on TV is now uh, an expert. So my point is, if you're a political leader or if you're a civil servant working in government, uh, there's a lot of noise and to figure out what to do. And every person has their latest app that they think is gonna solve the, the whole pandemic. Everyone has their new treatments, uh, including, and, and sometimes those ideas get platforms like at the White House, where uh, talking about crazy ideas about things people could do to themselves or, um, uh, or uh, just a, a, a doctor who decides to go on YouTube and talk about using um, soaps and stuff to wash your uh, fresh produce with before eating it. Um, my point though is um, it becomes really, really difficult. So I do have some sympathy. That being said, as researchers, we get we, we have options. First, of course, we have to do the rigorous work. We do have an obligation to do everything we can to try to get those research findings into policy or into at least the policy process to be considered as part of, of a response. Um, we need to think in networks. Individual policy decisions are not made by a single person. They're made in networks, often touched on it by a hundred people before a decision's made. And we need to also know that our research can help hold 
political leaders and governments accountable for their decisions there afterwards. And so in that respect, research isn't only relevant to inform a decision that's made at a point of time, that same research can be very helpful in informing whether that decision should stay in place or whether it should evolve over time. And so that's, I think, that accountability function that research can serve is, in my view, equally as important as the focus on trying to ensure that at the beginning it can inform the decision before it's made. Okay, thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, I wanted to just open up that kind of question, that particular question a bit more, just uh, ask all the uh, panelists to share your opinions and experiences. Uh, so given all that that we have learned in the past two years, uh, can you all share, I wonder if you could share uh, your insights on the role of mathematical modeling uh, in public health going forward. And also we know uh, the uh, scientists, the uh, interaction with among scientists and also governments sometimes could be uh, strained. Uh, so what would be an ideal kind of way of, for Stephen touched a bit on this uh, for scientists, the government to interact? Okay, so feel free to, to jump in. Uh, uh, sure. So uh, I think uh, that we've experienced many different interactions between government and scientists and industry and scientists over the over the pandemic. Um, those that are most fruitful are ones that incorporate, you know, questions from government to scientists, you know, so that we can try to tackle something that's going to be meaningful. And also those that also uh, provide data uh, where uh, we can use that data to inform our model so that we, we make sure that the results that we get from our modeling are applicable. Um, it's hard to determine what uh, governments are going to decide. Um, we, we've tried, I guess, when we talked earlier about uh, incorporating decision-making at the individual level in terms of you know, masking or going to get vaccines. Um, we can also try to incorporate political decision-making in, in looking at mandates. And, and incorporate that into a sensitivity analysis that we can really project into the future. But I think it's important. I think one of the earlier questions, uh, there was a question that said predict and, and I was answering with project. Um, we, can, we can project, uh, we, don't, we can't necessarily predict exactly what's going to happen because the knowledge that individuals get and governments from scientists and all the other uh, other things that they have to consider when they're making their decisions. Uh, it, it means that the, what the model projects will, will probably not be correct because it's changed the behavior ahead of time. Um, and so I think that in terms of moving into the future, uh, there needs to be some more um, discussion, I guess, as to how modeling can be incorporated into decision-making in a way such that it's not believed that the models have to be perfect or right, but they can help inform. Okay. Amy, Maybe you want to add something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm really interested to hear what Stephen has to say on this. So I thought I'd go next. <laughs> uh, so I think when the pandemic first started, there was such a demand for every single province putting out their projections for what, what is the future of the number of cases. And so to me, that indicates that there's a real need for people to be trained in mathematical modeling that are already employed by the government and that are part of public health. So I would like to see people working in public health with ability in modeling as part of the government uh, permanently all the time. But so one of my favorite things about the pandemic has been the Ontario Science Table, the independent BC modeling group and independent SAGE out of the UK. These are academics that are separate from the government. I mean, I think the Ontario Science Table has a, an obligation to report to the government, but I think it's really important also to have independent university researchers who can be independent, also using their skills for communication. It's so easy for us to read the literature and understand what's going on. That's not a skill that the public has. So I would like to see one, you know, something that comes out of this pandemic is that we see more modelers working in the government, but also that we see the value in those independent science tables, because I think the contributions that were made by them during the pandemic have been really outstanding. 
Mark, I, I agree with my colleagues 100%. We do not have enough mathematical modelers of infectious disease and other public health matters in our country. Um, I think there's widespread recognition of that now in light of the experience of the last couple of years. If anyone in the audience is interested in a career, uh, a very vibrant <laughs> career, mathematical modeling and public health, is going to be an amazing career opportunity for folks who are interested yeah. in it. I, um, I'd say though, at the same time, um, we need to think about where mathematical modeling can be helpful. Uh, but at the same time, we have to be really careful that that work doesn't get misappropriated or, or misused by those who are then tasked with making decisions on its basis. I think Jane's point was such a good one, Amy, and you built on it um, around the difference between projection and prediction because I would say that nuance, which is so important, was not then made you, or was not used when it then came to the decision-making or then when it came to communicating or justifying those decisions to citizens. Now, I'm not a mathematical modeler, so I, I don't know the right, the, I don't know the right way or the best way of translating this work uh, into language that does resonate with citizens. But I also know that we have some amazing mathematical modelers like those uh, on this panel uh, who have been in the media at some points every day. Jane, I know at some points you were on like 20 times a day talking to different outlets, trying to convey this. And the point is, I don't think we can count on our, 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 our we, only, we don't have enough of people to do it. And um, we need to be able to figure out as a society, how can we leverage what this amazing set of tools can do but also how do we communicate around it to recognize its limitations? Because it will only be, I think my colleagues will agree, it will only be one input into informing decisions, a very helpful one. But I think everyone here would also agree that you wouldn't wanna just take a projection off of, uh, out of the computer and then like right away run with it as fast as you can to a cabinet table for a decision. There's a whole lot of contextual factors, sensitive analysis and other um, decision points that should be made around it at the same time. Thank you very much. I uh, probably asked a question that's uh, so, uh, related to this, <clears throat> but somehow based on my own uh, personal experience during the pandemic, uh, the, uh, we worked closely with, uh, during the past two years, with my research group at the University of Alberta, with uh, Alberta Health. Uh, the collaboration has been really fantastic. Uh, we have people, they have in-house modeling who know uh, modelers who actually trained in mathematical modeling as Amy kind of suggested. And uh, so they serve as the uh, knowledge translator uh, between the public health questions to us and they can translate to us in terms of the modeling questions so that we don't misunderstand uh, what exactly what the question was. And then when we have a results, then they serve also as a translating so that in the language of uh, policy or recommendation to public health. And uh, so that has been very, very uh, great, I think. And uh, also the, the advantage of that is uh, if we need a data, we get it in the day or two. So that's, that's absolutely fantastic. And, uh, but uh, I, my question is, uh, do we, should we expect modelers to interact directly with the government? Uh, the public health policy in our province is not uh, is not part of the uh, public health minister. Uh, health minister is part of the government, the cabinet. Uh, so I think our uh, chief uh, medical officer of health made it clear she made recommendations and the cabinet made decisions. So, so uh, mothers, I, as a mother, I only interact with the public health and make decisions. Our results was part of the evidence for them to uh, make a recommendation that cabinet make decisions. So do you see a role of the modeler directly interact with the policy makers, decision makers? Yeah, Jane. <clears throat> yeah, I wanna say though, so, uh, one of our colleagues, uh, uh, Babak from BC CDC uh, from ages ago, when we were talking about uh, pandemic influenza, he, he asked a question. He said, what if we have two models uh, and they both project or they, they both, the, the results are contradictory. What should we do in this, in this case? And I said, we, we need to go get another model. 
And so I, I do agree that it's important for um, uh, people that are modelers and, and modeling literate to be working in government. Um, but it's also important for researchers to also have connections with government to inform uh, decision makers because researchers, uh, all modelers can tackle questions in a different way. And, and so when you can source many models that maybe project something similar, or if they have some things that are different in the results, then you can dig down deeper to really understand why those differences are happening um, between the models. And so uh, I agree that we need to have more modeling literate people and modelers working for government. I also think that that connection between academ academia and government needs to exist in order for us to uh, really get the best outcome, say during a pandemic when we needed to source uh, many models so that we can understand what the differences in the similar similarities are and where they really came from. Yes, thank you. Amy? Yeah, I, I wanna build on that and also uh, segue into a question that I see in the chat here, which is at a basic yep. level, uh, what factors can a mathematical model include? Economic factors, ability to follow public health measures, et cetera. And um, I think there can be a misconception that the more factors you put in the model, the, the better the model is. And so I think that the public can think if we make a really simple model that we're just not very good at our job or like we're not very aware of what's going on, but that can be deliberate for the point that Jane said, if you get models that are suggesting different things, then you wanna dig back and know why. And you know, it, it helps to not have put everything in the kitchen sink in your model to go through that process. So um, in terms of, so this would be one of my favorite things to talk about, the value of, of simple models or models that are just simple enough as, as Einstein puts it. And uh, you know, we can incorporate economic factors and, and, and behavior as, as Jane was talking about earlier. I think you need to tailor the model to the specific question that you're, you're wanting to answer because what's a sensitive parameter for one question might not be very sensitive for another. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to build on what Jane said about the importance of sensitivity analysis and including knowing what assumptions your, your results are driven by. I'll, I'll also you. add on one more thing to what Amy said is there's a huge critical thinking extra exercise when you're looking at modeling. Uh, when you want to model something, you need to really think first about how to translate the biology or the health into mathematics, and then how to translate the results from the mathematical model back into the biology. And I'm teaching mathematical biology right now. Um, York has a program, in undergrad, an undergraduate program in mathematical biology. And mostly what I do every day uh, instead of really focusing just on mathematical analysis, we focus mostly on that critical thinking component, trying to figure out exactly or what we need in a model in order for us to be, to have a model that's simple enough that we can do some analysis and get a result that then we can easily interpret back into, the, uh, into a, a public health or a biology answer. Yes, I, I totally agree that the training is one of the biggest job, important job we do at the university. And the training in modeling, that's, 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 that's give us, maintain the capacity for modeling so that we can support government. So, so Stephen, you wanna elaborate a bit on this? I will let you have the final word. <laughs> okay, well, thanks, Michael, for, uh, I love having the final word. <laughs> you know, um, I'll, I'll just say, you know, the previous comments, I think for me really highlight how important it is that those choices that get made when models are being developed, which then for me highlights the importance of ensuring that the mathematical modeling community is a community that's very diverse. Uh, with people coming from all backgrounds, all genders, uh, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, um, communities around the world. The reason is that uh, we make choices and sometimes we all have uh, unconscious biases um, that can accidentally result in models maybe working for some populations, not for others, some geographies, not others. Uh, the best modelers are exactly as, uh, as Amy was and Jane have been highlighting. It's making those critical choices, 
very specific to the question being uh, asked and answered. And so in, in that respect, um, making sure that future training programs are as inclusive and as encouraging of diversity as, as possible is going to be critical to make sure that mathematic modeling can continue to have the impact on public health as it did have amazingly so during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, thank you for all our distinguished panelists. So this is, the, we come to the end of the uh, event. And uh, let me thank to the uh, Fusion Institute uh, for hosting this event and uh, to everyone who attended and uh, for sending your great questions. Uh, of course, we couldn't cover all of your questions. Hopefully you can tease out some of the answers from the great discussions we have today. And uh, so we all hope this will be the last time we have to uh, host a COVID-19 themed, what the numbers say. But we know as from the discussions, we know we're not quite there yet. Uh, we're still very much in the pandemic state. We're hoping that uh, uh, you know we don't have a super variance to occur, but uh, we'll be here, right, uh, with uh, to answer your questions and uh, if the need arises. And uh, please stay tuned, stay posted for future what the numbers say events, where we'll be able to explore other timely and fascinating subjects that help us to understand the world around us using mathematics. So thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen, uh, Amy, and Jane for the great discussion. And thank everybody. So we'll say goodbye here. Thank you, Michael, to you too. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>